did have some, uh, 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 in fact, an individual doing what the Fed did, and that was J.P. Morgan, right? So, if you want, the, the point is not, in, in, in my opinion, the point would not be to get rid of the Fed, but to democratize the Fed, and uh, if you have, instead of, uh, if, you, if you don't want to do that, be ready for the next, to, to have very directly, the next time a crisis happens, to be Goldman Sachs themselves who are going to be the arbiters of what's to happen. So you should ask for a much more serious democratization of the Fed. Uh, remember, the Fed is a, is a creature of Congress. It can make it, it can unmake it, it can control it, right? It, the Fed has used many, has used its, its um, uh, all legal, legal mannerisms, all kinds of legal mannerisms to circumvent the democratic process. That should not be the case. There are central banks all over the world which function well, right? The Fed, the Fed for, for the most part, has not over the last 25 years. And it's time to change that. Can you give us an example of a federal uh, bank that worked really well in another country? So if we want to do our own case study, All right. we can see. Uh, well, there, if there's many, many banks around the world. Yeah. It really depends on what your desiderata are. So, for example, there are banks such as, uh, let me just give you an example, the Bank of India has made, made it very clear that banks could not, that, that the banks under their control could not um, lend against real estate beyond a certain amount of time. They were very cognizant of certain uh, bad behaviors. And if you listen to the Fed chairman, uh, the Reserve Bank chairman, he says, look, if you give people a chance to behave badly, they will behave badly. What do you expect? Right? So there are people, there are good policy makers all over the world who, who are good in this way. There are places to look at, Bank of Canada, other places. Yes. Concerned here uh, about what's what sometimes called a political business cycle, which is that the Fed, for many reasons, people have believed that keeping a central bank separate from the government is a good idea, uh, because if the, if it's not the case, the central bank has sometimes got to take unpleasant decisions, which will never be uh, taken by. Is, is that broadly yeah, the, yeah. the idea? Now. Um, and if you democratize, if you democratize the Fed, they'll never do that. So there's kind of two responses to that. What do you want the Fed to do? Right? Do you want the Fed to actually respond broadly to the kind of concerns of the people in this case? In which case they would have much more of an, a mandate to look at unemployment rather than inflation. That is actually a political question as opposed to a technocratic question. The technocratic question is. Uh, it, should the, should the um, Fed be kind of um, sealed away so that they can undertake certain decisions and undertake certain um, important, if unpalatable decisions? You can still do that. And the way you do that is to give them a mandate. Some countries have mandates saying keep inflation targeting at a certain percent. Keep inflation targets at, say, 3% or 3%. And then the Fed goes out and does that, or the central bank goes out and does that, and that's their only mandate. But that can be changed. And that can be changed by various kind of um, decisions of, in that would be of government, of Congress, whatever that is. So the Fed in the United States both sets the targets and 
makes the policy for change of terms. Yes. And yes. Saying that so the Fed is the actually... democratization would be by uh, uh, okay. giving them targets. No, 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 no. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that the Fed has been, in this particular country, the, the history of the Fed is a little unusual in that it is a creature of the private banks. In many, many other countries, it is not. So when I say democratization, I mean that you have the structure of the, the Fed such that its primary um, the, the, its primary personnel don't come directly from the from those banks, for example, and have the interest of, of the bank system uh, at its core, right? And there are many ways to do that. Okay? Uh, the, the kind of larger question that you're asking is a much more complicated, I think a real question about whether you should have some sort of uh, separation of, of policies. I think that in this country, the problem is not too much, but too little of democracy over the Fed. Direct control over what the Fed does, an ability to ask the Fed why it's undertaken certain decisions. So, for example, as you know, the decision to bail out AIG, it took a lot of effort to figure out where that money went. That shouldn't be the case, right? Especially if it's if it's putting the taxpayer on the on the hook. There is one question about war. Um, if you take a look at the longer, long run, sorry, long range impact of uh, government spending on the economy, there's two policies which have been the most destructive for the fiscal health of the economy. The first is wars, unfunded wars, and the second is the tax cuts, the, the here, push tax here. cuts of, the two, of 2002. Maybe you want to look at the other picture in, in one of the documents that I gave you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to put it back, it's my teacher coming out in me, right? But <laughs> if that was our a, chant in the march today. How, what do you do about the deficit? So I want Stop you to the wars and tax the rich. Take a look at this picture, right? That that tells you what the what was the cost to the U.S. of extending tax cuts for the upper income brackets and comparing it over the appropriate time to how much of a shortfall there is in social security. Guess what? You could cover that, right? So all the worries about social security. Now I'm I'm old enough to remember that the Bush Gore debates in which uh, Gore was mercilessly mocked for the for the, the for the lockbox, right? From the from uh, it's Saturday Night Live. Now think about this. I think for it's it's turned out it's been right because those tax cuts could have funded social security and not and would not have this kind of debate that we're having right now. So wars and tax cuts have been the most un unfunded wars and tax cuts have been the most destructive for this So you could raise the cap on social security, and, and that, that's that. Yes. So as you know, the social security is capped at a certain level. I forget what it is now. One hundred six thousand dollars a year now. Um, anyone who makes above that, not paying anything more, uh, progressively into into social security. Sorry. Did the Fed actually institute the recession in 1982 in order to break inflation? Yes. Ah. And the benefit to that was actually to corporate America rather than to the individual. The, it's, in, it's interesting. Actually, the people who suffered the most from that they were not in this country. They were in Latin America. You created a decade of destruction in Latin America from, from what happened here. That was a, actually, if, that, if, if the kind of destruction that you saw in Latin America was domestic, you would have had a much bigger res uh, angry response at the recession of, of, of the 80s. But it was considered very popular at that particular point of time because it got rid of inflation, which was damaging people's um, real real wage over the last few years. But also, but yeah, but you can also, the consumer was almost effectively winning, even though they're paying 15% inflation, their interest rate was 17%, so that they were on the plus side, yes. but the money was on the negative side, so they kind of used Reagan to lean on the Fed to engineer this, right? So, so, okay, real this compensation is not yeah, well, well, well. All right, all right, all right. So, so the yeah. question is, if I, if I understand the question, for whom was Reagan acting? Is that broadly the kind well, of question? Well, for whom there's a Reagan? You see that we have a difficult time exerting influence on the Fed, and I was just using that as an example of maybe where they were able to do it. Yeah. Uh -oh. Look. 
<laughs> All right, but but uh, the the question is who what who benefited the most from that? There is there is and and it was, was there not a political pressure towards that? And the answer is yes, there was a political pressure towards that. And this this is not a secret. You can one of the nice things about disclosure is that you can actually read Fed minutes. Of course, seven years after the after the, after the fact, but the business historians who've looked at looked at the kind of decisions that have been made. And I urge you to take a look. I, I, I leave my email here and I will send out to anyone who's interested some papers where people have gone through the minutes of the Fed. And it's very clear that they're not interested at that point in making sure unemployment is low. They want inflation down because the real rates of interest are not good enough for a group which we might call rentiers right now, right? Thank you. I, I have to I'm going to make do a mic check real quick to update everyone on what's going on right now. Sure. Thanks. So can you give me a good time out? All right. Okay. The march! The left here! The left here! Is at North Station! Is at North Station! They're going to hop on the Zakem Bridge! They're going to hop on the Zakem Bridge! They're going to jump on the Zakem Bridge! They're going to jump on the Zakem Bridge! They're going to jump on the Zakem Bridge! Shut it down! And, and shut, shut it down! down. What we are doing! What, what we are doing! doing is expanding our camp. Is expanding our camp. If you have a tent here, if you, you have, have a tent, tent here, here, and you would like more room, and you would like more room, follow us. Follow us. We're going over there. Because we're, we're going over there. there. Woo! Ow! Not jumping off the the, the point that is being made is a, a, a correct point that it was Carter, not Reagan. I should actually have said it was the Volcker recession because uh, it just coincided to at that point of time. That is the first point. Right. The second point is to understand the Fed's uh, reaction functions, what they do. One of the key variables is unemployment duration. And when the duration of unemployment gets small, the Fed triggers recessions because it doesn't like the upward pressure. So it's, yeah. it's very wages. Uh, it's much more connected with labor market developments than the standard discourse would ever uh, Yeah. And yes, you okay, so I just want to repeat that. that. Uh, Great. The the whenever the unemployment duration becomes when the unemployment duration becomes long, this is you are you. When the unemployment duration gets long, the Fed has a reaction function to that, and the Fed then rea raises interest rates at that point of time, right? Sorry, when, it gets, when unemployment duration gets short. Okay, let me do that again. Sorry, when unemployment duration gets short, it 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 basically is a situation where there's upward pressure on wages. Um, and because there's upward pressure on wages, prices go up, and so a very strong predictor of whether the Fed will raise interest rates is how long or short the unemployment duration is. I should just say that this is actually a very strong statistical relationship. There are not many people who have actually written about it in great detail, in very convincing detail. But that person is one of them, right? And you should read. You should read. Her work on this. Yes. Right. Where's the book? Tell her name. Julie Shore. Oh, Julie Shore. What's the name of the book? There are many, many papers she's written on this. Yeah. What's the name of the book? Sorry. The name of the last one is Julie Well. The last book she's written is True Well, but there's many other interesting ones like The Overworked American and The Overspent American, which you should read. And I'll stop plugging her because she's going to feel embarrassed. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you talked, if you could talk a little bit about the bank bailouts uh, yeah. that happened just as the recession was starting. Yes. It's now a popular thing, both on the left sure. and the right, to criticize the bailout. At the time, they were saying it was going to be an even bigger catastrophe. Yeah. Uh, if they didn't do it, which is why they rushed it through. So, what do you think about it? How would you have done this? Look, this is a, this is a very difficult question. What would because you're dealing with a counterfactual? What would have happened if there wasn't a bailout, right? And I think well-meaning people have when 
disagreements about this. I have my own opinion. My own opinion is that you would have had a bad situation if you did not have the bailout. Right? But right from the beginning, it was very clear that the bailout had to be done in a, in a different way. And, that, and this is not post facto people saying, you know, it should have, you know, uh, we didn't know at that time, but we would have done it different. At that time, people were saying the wrong, it's a wrong thing to mistake a solvency crisis for a liquidity crisis, which is basically to say the banks were insolvent, they were bankrupt, they should have been taken over, they should have, people who were uh, shareholders in the bank should have been liquidated, people who, owed, who the bank owed bondholders should have been given a haircut, which means they should have gotten lower returns, and you would have created a much healthier banking system and, and also not lost so much political capital at that point of time. That didn't happen, and that's part of what this is all about. I wouldn't want to, to get that, that righteous anger is right. Right? Whether it's from the left or the right, wouldn't they were right about that. So, sorry? Wouldn't that have wiped out a whole bunch of people whose pensions were locked up and all of that? They, they would, there are losses to be made. When, when the losses are definitely going to, yeah, going to happen, like right? It's it's, but who is going to take the losses? And it should not be the people who, who are... Um, it should not be the people who have gone in to the uh, business of banking who are bailed out. They the, they've actually shown themselves to be to have failed in their in their job. At that point of time, you don't reward them. You don't say, "Oh, it's okay, right? We'll we'll make you whole." You say, "You you've made a mistake. You're out." Right? If we're going to kind of come out, come in and save your hides, we get to take control. It happened in, in that way in other countries. Britain, for example, that's what they did. It, it was just a political decision here to not do that. And now you'll hear people. I don't know if some of you saw that really uh, uh, irritating. CNN uh, segment with Erin Burnett went around saying, oh, we made money on the tarp, isn't that good? Right? I, 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 right? It, there's, that was wrong with so many, in so many levels, because even from her perspective, which would be a purely capitalist perspective, the correct thing to have done at that point of time is to liquidate the shareholders. Right? So it's a question of how you did what you did at that point of time, according to me. Other people have said, let them fail. I don't know what would have happened. I, I think oh, there would have been worse, a worse catastrophe. Well, this is why you really stay in here because we got a chance. Any other questions? So the problem isn't the bailout. The problem is that the bailout was handled. Yes. Just, uh, just go window. Shop the bank. Let's, let's let some other people talk. talk. Maybe you guys from the INS were handled in Sweden in the 90s. They, they could have. They, there was there was that expert capital to rely upon to chop this stuff down. Yes. And they, you know, uh, uh, 1950 they expanded the FDIC mandate to include. This idea that okay, maybe we will inject some moral hazard to the system. I, I, th I think what what he's saying is it's not that this was not known. There've been bailouts all over the world, right? In fact, if you if you remember, Obama said, you know, uh, people look at Sweden, we're not sweet. It's true, but you could learn something from them, right? And I think that that was what. Um, uh, I think that's broadly what you're saying. There have been many kind of situations in which that this, these kind of um, decisions have had to be made. And it's not something either new or something in which people could say, we made a mistake because we didn't know. They knew at that point in time what they were doing. Yes. Yes. All right. So, so the question is, how much of taxpayer money has actually been spent um, uh, on this uh, to solve this crisis? There would be, if we believe the crisis was solved, which we don't right now. Um, it depends on how you parse it, but let's say that you would want to add the stimulus money that has been spent, right? To say seven hundred billion dollars. Uh, the money that was spent uh, to, to um, bail out the counterparties of AIG, which are not getting back about $180 billion. And then there are other ways in which bailouts have, have happened, which people don't speak about, um, and which is very hard to quantify. For example, the Fed, uh, because the federal funds rate, the rate at which banks can borrow is so low, they're basically getting virtually free money. And where are they spending it? They're spending it on, on trading, and commodity bubbles, things which make it much more expensive. It's very hard to quantify that particular amount, but in just in, in the bare minimum, it's close to a trillion.
just to expand on that, yeah. these guys have about $16 trillion outstanding loans in the current banking system that they haven't collected on. It. So when he's talking about writing checks at low interest, that's all going around and churn right now. That's all being used to shore up balance sheets so that people can actually borrow money in theory, but not in the practice. That's right. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the potential or lack thereof for Dodd Frank to prevent some of the structural problems within the financial system so that moving forward we don't have problems such as the 2008 financial crisis. All right, so th this is a true wonk question. Dodd Frank, Bill? Which people have heard of, but no one knows. I haven't heard of it. I don't know what it is. The, Do the Dodd Frank bill is kind of the cornerstone bill, which is supposed to uh, deal with um, um, financial crisis and financial uh, regulation from here on out, right? And the question is, can can it um, uh, prevent something like this from happening again? Look, uh, the American Recovery no, no, this is not the ARRA, this is not the stimulus, this is, a, a, as of yet, somewhat, it, it's, it's something that's part of as of yet, an ambiguous uh, policy, and I'll tell you a little bit why. People are debating a very key part of it, which, is, which may or may not come online. Uh, you've seen people walk around with something that says, bring back glass table, right? right? And that, that's a policy, which is a policy which separates certain functions certain functions of the, of the banking system. Um, it's not clear whether that is actually going to, to, to be in place in a really functional way. Um, there's, there's a lot of debate about that. One of the things, the biggest problem is that I find it hard to believe that uh, with the kind of banking concentration that you have now, which is actually grown, that if there is a real crisis like this, you will not have very severe consequences again. That was I, a new deal. 430s, wasn't it? The glass eagle, yes. Was in the 30s. Right. Right. The restrictions on retail banking held by Glass Eagle wouldn't have stopped that. No, that's right. But Universal Banking certainly created a bigger mess by bringing deposits into the system that it could be front of. All right, so, so the broader, but I think the, the, for me the key question really is, it has been, it has to be compared to being, being actually um, uh, conquered. And I, I don't think that, that, it, that, that has happened at all. I, I, I certainly don't think that's the case. Can you please talk a little bit about the difference between uh, the bailout, if you will, of the financial and banking industry versus uh, the inability for uh, the, the failure to, if you will, bail to manufacturing? Okay. In the collapse of manufacturing. That, that, that's actually a, a very interesting question. So for those of you who didn't hear, the question is, can you talk about the difference between the bailouts of the financial industry and the bailouts of manufacturing, like GM and so on? Um, um, I think it's become... It, there, there used to be a time when... I don't know who came up with this statement. It's, it's a statement which I know from uh, American popular history, what's good for GM is good for, for America. No, CEO of GM. GM, right? I, I, and um, <laughs> there was a book, there was a, there was a, a paper that came out recently which, is, which had the title, What's Good for Goldman Sachs is Good for America, right? Now, what, why, is, why, did I say, why was that paper named that? It's basically a change in the political economy where the, the kind of key industry of the states has moved from being manufacturing to being the financial sector, right? And then when that happens, the kind of concerns of government, in the, 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 the natural, um, if you will, the, the natural power brokers are now the, is, is now the financial sector. So what happened dif uh, differentially? Well, what's, what you notice that, was, that happened very interestingly is that the kind of policies, the kind of hard-nosed policies that were followed um, in, in the kind of limited bailouts of the uh, auto industry were not followed with the financial sector. It was a much more hands-off approach to the financial sector, right? And that's just a reflection of, I think, the underlying power structure in, in that particular case. Right? Didn't, uh, yeah. Just to follow up, didn't they uh, pretty much take over GM, restructure it, put it back together, and it went brilliantly? You know, I shouldn't speak, you should, tell, you should say a little bit more about that, because I don't know the, all the details about what happened to GM. Do, do you have any insight about exactly the, the policy? 
been some time. It was a full takeover, and it was a structured bankruptcy, but they basically kept the industrial sector in order. They refitted. They're actually making money, but it's from using that the source of the money is actually sales in China. They're treading, <laughs> they're treading water in the States, but they're still here. They've saved, I don't know, how many billion jobs by actually failing them. That's an example of lemon socialism that made a delicious lemonade. Okay, thank you. That, it's always good to have people who know these details and in the crowd, right? Could you talk a little, could you follow up and talk a little bit more about the force multiplication effect of what you said, you know, the hands-off approach? Right. Does it have any kind of, it must have some kind of force multiplication effect in the bank and the financial world? Well, I, I would say I don't understand what, what is the force? Hands -off, my, my, government's hands-off approach yeah. towards the financial <laughs> banking industry as opposed to their um, insisting on the letter of the law, if you will. Right. So what kind of force multiplying effect does it have in the, in the private sector, in the financial world? Oh, you mean who, 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 who's, who is benefited or what is the well, force like, multiplication effect? I'm sorry, much, I'm, I'm like how, much of, how much of a force multiplication effect is their hands-off approach on the financial and banking? Uh, I, I, if, I, if I understand... That, does it allow them to like, lo like lift these children and say, have like zero in, like interest free loans, which obviously is... I see, I see. You know what I mean? So, so what are the I'm other sorry, kind I'm of things that it? No, I, my fault. I wasn't comprehending. No, exactly. So the, the the question, if I understand correctly, is what are the other kind of things which allow for the financial sector to uh, be bailed out while uh, in, in a kind of hands-off way? Yes. So is, are there the backdoor bailouts, in other words, that are going on? Yes. So for example, this federal funds. Um, uh, the rate that I was telling you, the rate at which banks can borrow from other banks, so rather from, from the Federal Reserve, is very low. It's a very, very low rate of uh, interest. So they can borrow and spend and, and, and lend on whichever way. What you'll notice is that your credit card debt is not becoming any cheaper. Your credit card interest is not becoming any cheaper. Right? And you, you could imagine that, that the lower uh, interest that they're borrowing would get uh, transferred on. That's not happening. There are many ways in which there are probably things going on, um, um, such as, uh, for example, foreclosures and, and uh, policies towards uh, uh, household uh, affordability that would suggest that if you were really hard-nosed, you would force the banks to say, all right, uh, give uh, a lot of forgive a lot of debt of the of uh, households, take the losses on and, and deal, become clean over time. Right? None of that is happening. So there's many different ways in which they're actually being supported, which is not uh, directly to a bailout. Howard! So, Howard! All right. Any Howard. other questions? Yeah, is that, is, is that realistic to, uh, to um, uh, what would you say about the forgiving debt? Yes. Uh, is that politically is that possible? Debt forgiveness happens all the time. It's totally and completely possible. Right? I, I, and I think there's... Sorry, can you just say that one thing again? Because that was really key. Debt forgiveness happens all the time. It's totally possible. Right? <laughs> would it be prudent? So this is, a, this is an interesting thing, right? I mean, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm taking the loss on it, yes. I'm, I'm not in favor. Right. So, so this is an interesting, interesting question. Right? When you have a crisis, someone is going to take it. Right? Now the question is, can you do it, can you manage it in such a way um, in which the people who either overextend themselves, the people who, are, um, uh, who, who made the mistake pay first? Yes, you can find some ways. To now there are some some ways in which you're going to actually have to realize that that money is not going to come back, and you're going to have to figure out ways. This happens all the time under capitalism, right? You have loans which are not going to come back in that particular period of time. You find ways of rolling over debt. That's what banks do all the time. Can I say something right. to follow you up? Uh, I was reading an economist that said in the last four years. The 13,500 the richest American families lost about 11.1 percent of their total wealth, whereas the next, the rest of the population lost a whopping 37 percent. So the wealth, wealth is actually transferred upwards. Oh, I don't think there's any argument that the wealth has been transferred upwards for how long has the wealth been being transferred upwards in this country? Um, if you take the <laughs> share of the top one percent of the since, since we're talking 99% and 1%, I think it's a good number actually. If you take the share of the top 
It was the highest in 2007 that it is that has been since records were actually kept. What about trickle down? Broadly, is it okay. when, when the rich get richer, won't the um, just make the pie larger? Or yeah. as as right. I think, I think Bush said, the, the Bush said, uh, make the pie higher. I believe, right? Is, <laughs> I think, is, the, is, the, phrase, is the phrase that he, he gave. Now, um, there's there's nothing intrinsically wrong with the idea that you could actually have a situation where the rich get richer faster than the poor get rich. Now you might want to ask whether that's a healthy economy in the first place, but you can make that statement. But it turns out that that's not what's happening in the US, right? What's happening in the US is that real wages have been stagnant since the 60s and actually been falling since the 60s. If you take, uh, take a picture, and I, again, all of these are things that I can actually make pictures for people and send around to people are interested at all. And you can make a book or a scrapbook about these pictures. <laughs> take a look at wage, wage growth and productivity growth, right? Wage growth has been going like this. Productivity growth has been going like that. Now, typically what you should have is that wages keep up with productivity, right? You produce more, but then you get higher wages. Not the case, right? So what has been happening in this last, um, I would say the last 20 years, is a kind of polarization of the of the, of the, of, the, uh, uh, of wages. There's been a big fall in the, in the uh, wage rate of the middle the, the middle income groups relative to the top right and it's not really a question of the bottom 10 and the top 90 it's really the middle which has suffered the most 